Welcome into No Boundaries here on Sky Sport, a Cricket World Cup semi-final special. Of course, we're talking India and the Black Caps on Kedi Stadium in Mumbai. What a game of cricket it was. India deserved winners getting through by 70 runs over the Black Caps. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. It has been a big night and these two gentlemen have had a long night as well. Plenty of coffee as well and, and not much sleep. Colin Monroe, Mike Hess and good to see you again, gents. Hess, remarkable game of cricket, not just because of some of the individual performances, but just the way New Zealand stayed in the fight at the end, but perhaps just that start India had uh, just a bit too much for the Black Caps. Yeah, I think after winning the toss, the way India dominated the power play sort of put pressure on New Zealand. I think New Zealand was sort of slow to adapt in that period, got behind the game, and then from that point on, New Zealand were always fighting to get back in it. You know, 397 uh, was always going to be a pretty tough chase. Uh, and after losing a couple of wickets and seeing how much the ball moved, you know, New Zealand were, were behind the eight ball, really. Uh, but the way Mitchell and, and Williamson played gave us hope. And I think that's, that's what you want when you're chasing a score like that. But you need everything to go your way. You need Phillips and, Cam and uh, Chapman to come out and play really, really well. Um, unfortunately, they weren't quite able to do enough and, and Mitchell was left to do most of it. But it was a, you know, it was a really good effort um, you know, against a high-quality Indian side. Colin, it was funny, uh, in the week uh, Rohit Sharma said the toss wasn't going to be effective. We know what happened with the pitch ahead of the semi-final and in the end it really did turn out to be consequential, didn't it? He batted so well at the top, set the tone for the rest of that order and uh, they batted supremely well. Yeah, I think that was probably the key difference if you're going to look at the game uh, in general. It's that first 10-15 overs, like he said, the ball was moving around a lot for the Indian bowlers but uh, Saudi and Bolt didn't quite get that same movement and you know they came out there Played, ag played aggressively, both Shubman Gill and Sharma. And then, you know, Coley comes in, gets mm. his 50th 100. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then Shri I thought, came out and played the, the innings um, that I know that he's capable of playing some RPL cricket with him. But, um, yeah, he was outstanding, took the pressure off Coley, and they got a massive total that we just couldn't chase down. Yes, I, uh, we saw the text message come through from you during that first innings and Nasser Hussain said maybe they need to try something different, maybe a few cutters and you text her and said at the same time maybe they need to try something slightly different. Were you surprised perhaps at the, at the tactics of the Black Caps in the field in that first innings? Could they have done anything different or was it just simply how India were batting in dictating terms? Oh, look, I mean, Rohit Sharma came out hot um, but, it, you know, our, Bolton and Southie are swing bowlers, so they've got to see if it's going to swing. And they tried, and you know, Rowett basically capitalised on that. But I thought we were a little slow to adapt after that. Once we recognised that it wasn't going to swing, um, the wicket was slow, you know, how were we going to try and create some opportunities? So I think we, we were probably four or five overs too late to go and cut to cutters, and Southie pretty much got one straight away when he got Rowett out. But by that time, you know, the game had sort of slicked, snuck away from us a bit. You kind of needed a cluster, didn't you, at the top of, of wickets? Uh, obviously, we've got Rohit Sharma. But it's been an issue, hasn't it, for the Black Caps and other teams at this World Cup striking in that first power play, particularly against a side like India? Yeah, it is. And that's, that's the, I think, the, obviously, their strength is, is their batting, uh, in my opinion. Um, and they're all in form. You know, Shri Azaya hasn't played a lot of cricket um, coming into this World Cup. He's had some back issues. And for him to come in and score, I think it's four fifties on the bounce, and now including this hundred, uh, two on, two in a row is outstanding. So, yeah, I think you obviously nice to have wickets up front, um, but again, you know, it wasn't wasn't to be today, and you know, unfortunate for the Black Caps. Yes, I think every New Zealand fan was hoping when uh, DRS came up for Virat Kohli that we wouldn't see any feather, but there was just a little nick, a little edge, uh, inside edge on the bat. And obviously he went on to score a wonderful 100, 117, surpassed Sachin Tendulkar, 50 international ODI hundreds now. Remarkable winnings, but you think maybe, you know, if the cricket gods had looked on the Black Caps on that occasion, that could have been a turning point in the game. Look, it could have. I think India did get ahead of the game and, and you know, maybe they might have got 360 and it might have been a, an even more even battle, but... I mean, uh, you know, Virat, you don't really need to give him a chance in the form that he's in at the moment. Mm. In this World Cup, he's been exceptional. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he, uh, he obviously, Sachin came over and congratulated him, as did David Beckham, and I know he's a massive football fan, so I saw him actually kicking the ball around at one stage. So he would have just loved being able to do that in front of, you know, one of his heroes as well. Australia Sire, though, we talk about that third wicket partnership, 163. Colin, it really, it was the, the genesis of what was a, a wonderful innings, 397 for four, they scored India. But you've got to talk about the hand of, of Iyer and that, Shreya uh, Iyer, with, with Vera Kohli. Just the clean striking that he had and that swing that he's got. Um, you know, he's manipulated the spin quite well. Satna, I think he tried to do what he did in that last game against Sri Lanka, where he tried to change it up a lot. Um, missed his length a couple of times and then got hurt. So, 
yeah, Shia Zaya, you know, shows the the fitness too. They ran hard between the wickets when they needed to um, to put some pressure under on, on the on the black caps. And yeah, you look at you look through there, and he's he's hit he's hit eight sixes and, and four fours. So you think you know that's probably more like a T20 scorecard. I think when you look at this black caps bowling performance, the surprising thing I, I guess you'd say here is that uh, the four wickets New Zealand picked up were from their seamers, and we didn't get really any purchase out of Mitch Santner, Russian Ravindra, or, or Glenn Phillips. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't the sort of wicket where you're going to run through sides with spin. You really needed them to attack you. And I think because India got so far ahead of the game against the seamers early on, it was just it was more of a holding role against Satna. Mm. You know, they basically manoeuvred him around. If he missed, you saw Shreyas, uh, you saw Shubman Gill hit him down the ground a couple of times for sixes. But generally they sat on him and they could afford to do that, whereas the other three seamers all sort of went around the park, even, albeit they picked up four wickets. Shubman Gill, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the Black Caps road forward after this tournament shortly, but uh, if you're talking about the future of Indian cricket and, uh, and, and guys that might move on in the next cycle ahead of the next World Cup, this guy is, is unbelievable. The, his innings at the top, we talk about Rohit Sharma's innings and the power game and the way he set the tone and laid the platform, but it was a classy 80 from, from Shubman Gill as well. Well, yeah, I think when you look, there was talks about Shubman Gill and Prithvi Shaw when they were coming through the under-19s together who was actually going to you know, mm. get the test role and the ODI role as well. So you know, many people thought that it was going to be Prithvi Shaw, but Shubman Gill has come on and you know, he's dominated. His first-class record is phenomenal and he's taken that into the ODI format now and he's, he's sort of made that opening spot next to, next to their skipper, his own. Let's take a closer look, guys, at the Black Caps innings. We know run chasing hasn't, be a pro hasn't been a problem really for New Zealand at this World Cup. We talked about the start they needed. Uh, 39 for two, though, losing both of their openers, Devin Conway, Rush and Ravindra. Was that just a sign of the pressure, Hess? And, and I think Nasser Hussain talked about it in the first innings as well, what he would have done. You put the, the, the runs on the board, you bat first, you scoreboard pressure, and maybe that was evident at the start of that innings. Yeah, it was like two different games, to be honest. I mean, the amount of, the amount of swing that, that both Boomer um, and Siraj got in those first 10 overs was test match stuff. Um, it actually swung, and a huge amount it actually nipped as well. So your role as an opener in that time changes you know and it's really difficult when you're chasing 398 to go well hang on we've got to absorb this pressure and the ball's nipping around and we've still got to score at seven and over and that was the challenge um you know conway didn't look in vintage touch he got a, he got a couple of balls where he got some width but you know got beaten a lot um rutchen got beaten a lot even when they went around the wicket mm. you know which shows that um it, it wasn't easy and that's why I think it was just so important, um, the fact that, that Williamson and, and Mitchell were able to sort of absorb that. Otherwise, the game could have been over after 15 overs. What were you saying at top order batsman, Conor Monroe, from the Black Caps at the top there? Do you think the approach was right? Was it just a sign of just how well, as Hess has alluded to, that India were bowling? Could they have done anything slightly different? No, I don't think so. Um, I think they had their plans. They would have come out and absorb a little bit of pressure. I think when you're chasing it in Wankiti this year, a lot of wickets fell through their power play and then it put the teams behind and that's why there were some low scores chasing so yeah they obviously tried their best to to get through that initial stage unfortunately Xiaomi just had a day out and, and, and put the ball in the right areas and I thought Hess mentioned it earlier when Williamson and, and Mitchell came together pretty much even though we were behind the eight ball majority of the innings um, put us into a, a position of, of strength where we just needed a, a heroic uh, performance from either Latham or someone in that middle order to to try and get us over that line but you know, you need to have a lot go your way when you're chasing 397. Yeah, I mean, at the 30 over mark, we were, we were, we were at parity. So in terms from a run scoring perspective, we were pretty much the same. So we'd, we'd lost three more wickets, or two more wickets. And then we obviously had the over where we lost Williamson and, and Latham. But we're only really one wicket behind and maybe five runs at the 30 over mark. So, you know, even though we'd, we hadn't dominated in the power play, we did enough between 10 and 30 to get us to that point. It's just after that you needed to you know, to play incredibly well. You just think maybe this could have been a different complexion, as you say, 33rd over, 220 for three. Uh, then you lose, after Williamson, you lose Tom Latham for a duck. Um, Latham makes a few runs. Maybe we're having a different conversation right now. Maybe that's just the, I guess, the platform we, we needed for a guy like Glenn Phillips, just to have maybe a bit more time, a few more uh, runs to work with um, to try and chase that target down and, and take pressure off the guys like Mark Chapman and, and Mitch Santner as well later in the innings.
Yeah, a little bit. It's obviously you never like to go bang bang in, in one day cricket or in any format really. But um, you know, when you lose two wickets in succession, it's, it's hard work. Uh, you could always you, you even saw Daryl Mitchell, who was striking the ball really well, sort of go into a shell. I think at one stage the commentator said that he had, had only scored 11 and 20 odd balls, um, where somebody that was at the end of his innings striking at 112, um, you think that he's going to carry on and, and, and go. But when you have lost two quick wickets. Um, it does play on your mind. You want to build a little bit of partnership and you, you don't play your natural game all the time. Yes, a 70 run defeat, yes, but uh, when, well, we'll talk about Daryl Mitchell shortly, but you talked about that third wicket partnership, 181 runs. Um, it's really been the backbone of this Black Caps team for a very long time, even since you were involved. The, the way that they can construct innings, stay in the fight, stay in the hunt, and uh, as you say, um, I think most people, after watching that first innings by India, the way that they started, if they'd gone to bed for a kip and woke back up, they might have been thinking a completely different story or scenario, but they were right in the, in the game. I think New Zealand have adapted that that blueprint that they have around scoring runs. It used to be sort of, you know, 280 to 300. And I always thought coming to this World Cup, they might struggle to get those really big scores. Mm. But they've actually been able to get, you know, 350, 370, 400, and be able to just stretch the, the boundary a little bit. So, I mean, from a batting point of view, New Zealand have been exceptional. And a lot of that is condition-based, because the pitch is at our fast outfields, the ball skids on beautifully. But it also takes some ambition, and it also takes just stretching yourself from a batting perspective a bit. And that's why I think Daryl Mitchell has been so impressive. You know, coming in at four, not absorbing pressure, but actually straight away, first ball running down the wicket or reverse sweep or whatever, he actually takes the attack to the opposition. And that is a, it takes a lot of courage. Um, and I just think he's been exceptional this World Cup. We saw three centuries in this game, three very good centuries. As a chaser, how good was Daryl Mitchell's? I know it wasn't enough to get them across the line, but 134 off 19, uh, he was there for three hours. In those conditions as well, we talked about the heat at the start of this game, 38 degrees plus down pitch side. Um, just big as belief that the guy could stay out there. I think you said his legs were jelly. Yeah. You know, the, the, the way he managed to get through that innings and still play some of the power shots at the end was remarkable. Well, I'll tell you what, he's not because of the result, but he's not going to get much sleep tonight. <laughs> he's going to be cramping every time he turns around in bed. So Power rate at his bedside. <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to be <laughs> tough. Juice. But, yeah, he, he played exceptional, and I think... Uh, following on from Hess there, the way he's played in the last 18 months, it's fair to say uh, that he's a world-class player. Um, and it's not always we, we, have, we have that opportunity to talk about New Zealand players as world-class, because we've only had Kane or Bolt or Sally, those three. But you look through that team now, you've got world-class players from, from 1 to 11, and that's exciting for us moving forward. Um, but, yeah, heading back to Daryl, he's world-class. And like Hess said, he's, you know, that reverse, he's hitting it on point, he's got it under control, it's not just a, I need to get out of jail, bang, he's doing that to put pressure on the, on the, on the fielding team, change it and then hitting, hitting the ball where he wants to and manipulating the field really well. How special is it, Hess, you've spent a lot of time in India working, coaching, you know the stadium, you know the fans, you know what they're like, you know what the players are like, again, an, inning, an innings of 134 and a losing effort, but how special is, is, was that from Daryl Mitchell? Well, I think it was really good to see the Indian supporters stand up and applaud. You know, often, you know, New Zealand took a wicket and it was just, you could hear a pin drop, you know, or you hit a four and you wouldn't even notice. But they actually stood and they respected the fact that that's actually a high quality innings under pressure. The fact that India was still slightly ahead probably made it easier for them to stand up and applaud. But it was, it was just a really nice moment that, that they actually gone, hang on, that's, that's some respect there. That's a fine innings. Glenn Phillips won for me this World Cup. Uh, Colin, who is not only produced at times with the bat, nice cameo there, 41, sure off 33, could have done with some more, but just his, his overall contribution to the team with the ball as well, um, he, he's developed into a good all-round player. Yeah, to be honest, I was surprised at how well he actually went with the ball. Um, but, yeah, he's obviously there now. He's in the test squad, which is great, great for him. But he's done a great job, I think. He's, he's really worked hard on his bowling. Um, I remember still playing for Auckland all those probably four years ago, five years ago, he was bowling a lot. He would get to even a four-day game and he would be the first person out there bowling some tweakers. And, um, you know, he's, he works really hard at his craft and you can see the way he's actually using the crease. He's not just running up and bowling proper part-time stuff and hoping for a wicket. He's, he's actually really working, trying to work the batters out. And, you know, it's, as a part-time spinner, in one day cricket it's really tough you've got someone like graham swan giving up one day cricket because of the new rules when we only had four out so 
for him to come in and do a job like he did now was outstanding. We've got to pick a player of the match, I think, guys, before we get into the next part of this show, looking at the road ahead. But Ferret Coley, you know, he breaks the record, he gets 50, he gets his hand sh uh, shaken by Sachin Tendulkar. Mohamed Shami, though, we talked about it before this show, to come back like he has and uh, a 7 for 57, just astonishing. Yeah, in a high-scoring game. So for me, I'd, I'd go for the bowler. I mean, he's he thoroughly deserves it. I mean, Virat will get the accolades, as he rightfully should, because that's over a career. Uh, and it was it was a fine innings, as was Shreya so I, But to get seven wickets on a flat wicket in a game where you almost score 800 runs, uh, you know, 730 runs, is, is a supreme effort. And he turned the game on its head. He got the initial two, and then New Zealand put on 180, then he came back and he got another two. <laughs> yeah. So he, he's the guy who broke the game open. But now it is time to look ahead to the next semi-final, Australia and South Africa. And Colin Hess, I, sh I guess the question is, can anyone stop India, the form they've been in, undefeated at their home World Cup? Can you see Australia or South Africa whoever gets through doing that? Colin? Uh, for me, I don't see anybody getting past India. Um, in a batting World Cup, when you look at the scores that have been scored um, and you see the bowling attack of India, they got five world-class bowlers, whereas you look at potentially even our attack, you've got a part-timer coming on and bowling a couple of overs, and also in the Aussie attack too, the South African attack, you've got some guys that you can, you can really take, take to, um, whether they go with Peter Laquayo or, or someone like that too. So, yeah, I just think that India have, have all bases covered and going into a final, um, that's what you want. What do you reckon here? I mean, Australia, we know that they've got for example, the Maxwell factor and, and, and others, but you just wonder really if, if something like that's enough. As, as Colin's alluding to, it's going to have to take a collective effort from your bowling department or or indeed your top and middle order. A su substantial effort to shut down this Indian side. Yeah, I'd, I'd never discount Australia, unfortunately. Um, you know, even after two <laughs> games in the World Cup, we were like, oh, maybe they're not going to make it, and then they won seven on the bounce. Afghanistan um, were thinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, look, they are a very good side. And, you know, they are not quite as good as India. I agree with Munners. I think Munners, the India have got that perfect balance in terms of five proper bowlers, really good bowlers, and they bat deep. You know, they bat to seven, really good. Um, Australia are probably more of that old school, where they've got four good bowlers and they kind of make up their X with Maxwell or Stoinis and, and co. So um, this will be this will be a really good contest, I think. I think South Africa have a really good chance if they can treat it like any other game of cricket. And I think we all know the history about South Africa come semi-final time. Um, you know, it's happened so many times that it's, you know, it definitely is in their head. Um, so if they get put under pressure or if, or if Australia, um, or if they start to think that there's a chance of winning it, that's when they might start to overthink. But I think South Africa got a really good chance. If they get through, uh, then I'll back India to win. If Australia get through, then I'd go 50-50. What do you reckon, Colin? Who, who's going through to the World Cup final to play India? Uh, I think South Africa's going to get through, um, and there, I think India will win it. We can't have South Africa holding two World Cups at the same time, can we? <laughs> no, we can't. So, so, so batting isn't an issue with these teams. It's just out of uh, South Africa and Australia, which, which, if they can get their bowling line up to, I guess, make some inroads. Yeah, Calcutta is flat. So once again, it's flat, short boundaries. Um, it flies. So it's um, you know it's a really tough ground to defend. So you know both attacks are, are probably more predominantly attack with the new ball, not so good defensive skills. Um, and I think defensive skills will probably win this game because as you said, two power pack batting lineups. You know four to six from South Africa. You know with with Class and um, you know Miller and and Markram. That's as good as you get from four to six from an aggressive point of view. We know about the Maxwell factor. You got Stoinis um, through the middle there. So if if any of those get set at Eden Gardens, they're going to be very hard to, to contain. So, yeah, looking to see uh, yeah, how those defensive skills are. Colin, the word pressure gets thrown around a lot, uh, particularly when you've got your home World Cup, but you guess you'd say it hasn't really affected India. They've probably embraced it. They've walked towards it. Um, are they at that stage now where, you know, final, uh, World Cup home final, they're going to really absorb that rather than have it be, a, I guess, a burden? Yeah, you'd hope so. You, you wouldn't want them to get this far and then something like pressure get to them and, and capitulate sort of in, that, in, in the final, in the big game. So hopefully for them, um, it would be nice, obviously, when you're playing in your home country um, and some of those guys, you know, it's probably their last World Cup too, so to get a win would be nice for them. But all you want to do is, as a neutral now, I suppose, is just see a great game of cricket come tomorrow in that second semi-final and then when the final hits, you know, see a proper, you know, sometimes we've seen it in the past, finals are sometimes one-sided. 
um, it would be nice to see it go down to the wire. Yes, let's talk about this Black Cap side and what the road ahead looks like for them. Uh, obviously, it's been a wonderful, you know, eight odd years uh, since 2015. Number of finals, World Test Championship. Um, there's been some amazing players come and go. We've seen the emergence of players like Russian Ravindra. When you look at this current squad um, and, and, and the way forward, uh, who do you see perhaps leaving? Who do you see perhaps coming through on the domestic scene? What does this New Zealand team look like in a few years' time ahead of the next World Cup? Yeah, it's probably where the bowling, I think, we're going to see a bit of changing in that seam bowling. Um, you know, Bolton Southey, um, you know, even Henry's sort of, you know, mid-30s as well. Um, you know, you think Adam Milne, you think Lockie Ferguson. So there's sort of five seamers that probably won't be here in four years' time. Um, you know, they're, they're all at slightly different stages. but um, And there's not a, a huge amount at the moment just underneath. You know, uh, that's where someone like Kyle Jamison has got to absolutely pick that next group of bowlers and run with them. You know, they've tried a lot of a lot of guys on the recent tours. They, you know, they tried Shipley. Um, they've tried Duffy. Um, you know, Tickner's come in and, and, and done a bit as well. Um, they brought in the left armour from Auckland. Yeah, uh, Lister. Lister. Yeah. His name escapes me. So they've, you know, they've, they've tried lots and no one's really grabbed it just yet. And that's probably the area where I'm a little bit worried about the, the next group of, of black caps. From a batting point of view, I think we're fine. You know, there's, there's quite a few um, that are around the circuit that are coming through. Obviously, Rutchen, you've just seen, you know, Finn Allen. You know, you'd like to think that he's going to step up and, you know, and learn more about it, the one day game in terms of how he's going to operate. But he's certainly got the skill to do so. Uh, and batters can stay in the game longer. You know, they can they can hang in there. And there's a few in that batting group, um, you know, that have just had a taste of it. You know, even someone like Kane, the fact he's had a year off pretty much, you know, it's probably reinvigorated him. And it wouldn't surprise me if he's not there in four years' time. But, uh, yeah, it's the bowling group is the one that I'm a little bit concerned about with their next group is. What are you saying, Colin? Are you seeing some guys coming through on the, on the national stage domestically that could, like Russian Ravindra, break through and, and step up? I'm in, I'm in Hess's boat there too. I think the Black Caps, have, it's been hard as a bowler to try and break into this team because you've had Bolt, Southey, all those types of boys that have held their spot for a long time. Um, and the batters, we've had a couple of guys come and go here and there. But when you look at, you know, if you're a domestic seamer, mm. um, this is a big year ahead for you. Um, we've obviously got T20 World Cup and then the next World Cup. So. All those boys that are watching, if you're a SEMA in the domestic game, you know, put in hard yards and, you know, get a couple of poles, you might get the call up. Great to chat as always, guys. Thank you so much for your time over the last 24 odd hours uh, for this semi final, and we look forward to the final uh, this weekend. That is No Boundaries here on Sky Sport, and yes, we do look ahead to the World Cup final. India against either Australia or South Africa coming your way on Sky Sport.